This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening. Welcome to the CAPS Forum on Ethics and Public Policy. My name is Greg Jarrett. I represent the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. If you don't know about us, our three-part mission includes the teaching of real applied ethics on campus, our internship program, preparing promising students for careers in public service, and the third part of our mission is to bring in distinguished speakers to the campus and to the community to raise the level of discussion on matters of deep moral import. Since we're short on time, uh, I would just like to thank the following uh, professors and their classes for participating. Um, my own class on biomedical ethics, uh, Dr. Kathy Fultz, Dr. Claudia Tyler, Dr. David Cleveland, Dr. Ilario, Dr. Kreider, and Dr. Graves, and any other classes that are participating tonight. <clears throat> tonight, we are honored and privileged to have Ms. Anna LaPay, a widely respected author and educator, known for her work as an expert on food systems and as an advocate for sustainable food. Anna is the co-host of the PBS series, The Endless Feast. She is a featured expert on the Sundance Channel's Big Ideas for a Small Planet, for public television's Need to Know, and the PBS documentary, Nourish. <clears throat> Anna is the founder of the Small Planet Institute, an international network for research and popular education about the root causes of hunger and poverty. She's also founder of the Small Planet Fund, which has raised nearly a million dollars for democratic social movements worldwide. She currently heads the Real Food Media Project, an educational initiative about sustainable food using creative movies, an online action center, and grassroots events. Anna is an active board member of the Rainforest Action Network and an advisor to the International Fund to Amplify Agroecological Solutions. Her books include Hope's Edge, The Next Di Diet for a Small Planet, Grub, Ideas for an Urban Organic ki uh, Kitchen, and, and her latest book, Diet for a Hot Planet. Tonight, she will speak to us about the manifold implications of what we eat. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Anna Lepe. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's a particular pleasure for me because my father was an ethicist, and uh, he was actually the head of what was kind of colloquially known at the time, the Department of Ethics under the first Governor Brown uh, administration many years ago. And it was a department that he helped to found called the Office of Health and Values. So on the one hand, my father was an ethicist, and on the other hand, as some of you might know, my mother, Frances Moore LaPay, has spent a lifetime working on food. So I feel like there's sort of no better moment than to be here tonight talking to all of you about the connections between food and ethics. It's like in my blood in a real way. Um, so there, I've sort of grew up with these parents who, as you can imagine, really instilled with me 
these ideas about thinking about the ethics of our choices, and then in my mother's case, you know, thinking about food. As you can imagine, my mom's idea of a good time was not taking me to Disneyland, it was taking me on research trips to farming collectives in Guatemala. Uh, and my father's idea of a good dinner conversation wasn't, you know, what was the latest thing on television, it was exploring the ethical implications of his work uh, fighting chemical companies on behalf of farm workers. So. Uh, uh, so that was sort of what I grew up in, but I didn't really think that I was going to work on food issues or kind of do that as part of my career until 15 years ago. I was a graduate student at Columbia University studying international uh, political development, and my mother and I had this wacky idea to work on a book together. I have a lot of friends that can't even imagine going clothes shopping with their mothers, let alone writing a book with theirs. But my mother and I had this idea to write a book together. And we wanted to explore places around the world that would show us in action communities that were addressing the root causes of hunger, communities that were really building vibrant, sustainable food systems that kind of allowed everybody to thrive. And when I started out, I was her research assistant, and then she promoted me to her with author, and eventually I got promoted to be her co-author. But all my friends like to tease me, getting promoted by your mother isn't really that impressive. But it, it was this incredible experience to travel around the world. We went to India, Bangladesh, Poland, Kenya, France, Brazil, places throughout the US. And what I saw set me on what became 15 years of exploring these connections between food, ethics, and sustainability. And I had lots of moments as we did the research for the book that stuck with me. And one in particular, we were driving from New Delhi in India north into the foothills of the Himalayas to the city of Dehradun. And we're driving along on a dusty Indian road with my, it was my mother and me and uh, some of our Indian colleagues who were going to take us to visit farming cooperatives that they were working with. We're driving along and I noticed to the right of our car was a grove of eucalyptus trees with perfectly, perfectly straight trunks and across all of the trunks at eye level was the logo for Pepsi. And when we arrived at the village, our first village visit, when we arrived there, we discovered, talking to these villagers, that it had become now more easy for them to get a bottle of Pepsi than it was for their village to access potable drinking water. And I thought, at that moment, what are the implications of a global food system that makes that reality possible? You know, what are the implications of these now global food companies that are impacting the lives of people who live half a world away from where they're headquartered? And I became fascinated by myself exploring those connections. And so 15 years later, here I am this evening. And in this process of doing this work, myself and my colleagues and I, we have found ourselves called a lot of names. I have been called a food nanny. I have been called a member of the food mafia. I have even been called a food Nazi, which is particularly interesting as the daughter of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Poland. Particularly ironic to be called a food Nazi. I've, I've heard colleagues of mine called terrorists. I went to one meat industry conference that had a workshop on an anti-terrorist workshop where they talked about members of the, of the Humane Society and compared them to members of the Irish Republican Army and Hezbollah. But the name perhaps I have heard most, it doesn't quite have the sting of some of those other names, but the name that I have heard the most, of my colleagues and I called, is elitists. And so what I want to talk about tonight is this question, and it's a bit of a soul-searching question for me, um, and for my colleagues who work in sort of this broad and diverse food movement of this question, is this work that we are doing, is this promotion of organic farming and agriculture, is it an act of elitism, or is it an action of an ethicist? Is it ethical? And so what is it that we're promoting? What is it we're talking about when we're talking about organic farming and we're being called elitists uh, to suggest that we should be consuming more of that organic food? What we're talking about is what I like to think of as the difference between 
a very chemical intensive food system or oil intensive food system, we could call it, versus on the other hand, a knowledge intensive food system or a low input system. And what I mean by that is we're talking about a way of farming that replaces the inputs of synthetic fertilizer with the creativity of a farmer that works with the ecology of a farm to build soil fertility. What we're talking about is shifting away from the input of a petroleum chemical, a pesticide, herbicide, insecticide, and turning toward, again, that knowledge of how to work with the ecology of a farm to use beneficial pests and beneficial crops to deal with pests and deal with weeds. We're talking about moving away from a reliance of factory farms on drugs and antibiotics. You probably know that now 85% uh, of all antibiotics used in the United States are not being used in the human healthcare system. They are being used on factory farms. And not to prevent disease, as many of us think. About 15% goes to prevent disease. The rest is going to promote growth. So when we talk about organic food, we talk about certified USDA meat and dairy, we're talking about a kind of farming that doesn't add antibiotics as part of the daily feed in livestock, that tries to move livestock off of drugs altogether. I like what Europeans call it. It's a bit clunky. Maybe the poets among us might not like this, but the Europeans like to call this way of farming multifunctional. So it's a multifunctionality. And what does that mean? It means that we're talking about a kind of farming that benefits farmers because it means they don't have to rely on costly chemicals or those costly inputs like synthetic fertilizer or costly seeds like genetically engineered seeds. Uh, it means that it benefits farmers because it promotes that really healthy soil that helps our crops grow. It benefits the rest of us as well because low input practices promote biodiversity, which is key to food security. We all like to have food security. It protects pollinators, pollinators that provide uh, a kind of essential role in our food system. And it reduces on-farm energy use. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions from our food sector, which I think we can all say is a good thing. So it's this kind of multifunctionality that is also a part of this sustainable food and this organic food that my colleagues and I have been arguing we need more of and being told we're elitists for doing it. So part of the reason why I think there is such a strong reaction to those of us, uh, and there are many of us, those of us who are advocating for this way of farming, this way of organizing our food system, is because it is very threatening to not just one company and not just one industry, but it is very threatening to a whole constellation a whole constellation of corporations and economic sectors that, that are making a lot of money off of this way of farming. So think about it. The US makes up only 4% of the world's population. We use one third of the world's pesticides. So all those companies uh, that are producing those chemicals, Dow, Syngenta, DuPont, BASF, um, and a few others, the six companies that produce most of the pesticides in the world, they're making a lot of money off of this way of farming. Um, synthetic fertilizer, again, highly costly input. What is the biggest company today in the synthetic fertilizer business? It's Coke Industries. Why? Because one of the biggest ingredients of synthetic fertilizer is energy. So the Koch brothers have just put a $3.2 billion investment in a huge new fertilizer plant in this country because they are doubling down on their investments in synthetic fertilizer. So we're talking about the oil industry. We're talking, of course, about agribusiness, big grain traders like Cargill and ADM. Um, we're also talking about the pharmaceutical industry, which I think we don't think of as much as part of the food system. But animal pharma is one of the fastest growing profit areas for the pharmace pharmaceutical industry, in part because the regulations around pharmaceuticals for livestock is much more lax and lenient than it is for humans. So Eli Lilly and Bayer and other companies that are in that animal pharma business, this is a huge and growing area of their business to say that livestock should be raised on antibiotics and with other drugs. 
So as this demand I am seeing, as this demand and interest by consumers for organic food and among advocates to move us toward more sustainable farming, as that grows, what I have seen is a growing communications campaign against those of us who are speaking up for organic food and sustainable farming. And calling us advocates names is just one of those tactics. So I want to dig into this question about this particular name that we hear so much, this, this name calling of those of us who are supporting organic food are elitists. And I want to explore, is that true, where it comes from? And what I want to argue this evening is that despite what those calling these names might like us to believe, that advocating for organic food isn't just benefiting uh, the sort of latte sipping, Tesla driving, maybe Santa Barbara living, Whole Foods shopping customer, uh, that it's advocating for a way of farming that benefits all of us. In other words, as I said, it's not elitist, it's ethical. And, and here's what I mean by that. I want to I talk about three, three things that I, that I really want you to get in your mind about how this benefits all of us. Three kind of categories of people. And the first are farmers. So one of my favorite farmers that I got to meet through this work, he, um, he passed away last year at, in his late 80s, but one of my favorite farmers I ever met doing this work was a man named John Kinsman. And I met him in Wisconsin at the height of, when he just started getting really active as a dairy farmer in fighting against the artificial growth hormone that was being used at the time, being sold by Monsanto to farmers like him. And he'd become an organic dairy farmer kind of late in life, and had, when I met him, he was just this most incredible, energetic uh, farmer and activist I'd ever met. And one of my most incredible experiences with John Kinsman was traveling with him to the West African country of Mali in his, I think, early 80s at the time. And the man had more energy than any one of us, uh, many of us more than half his age. But when I met John Kinsman, he was this diehard, organic dairy farmer in the middle of Wisconsin, but he hadn't always been. He'd grown up as a conventional, grown up on a conventional dairy. He was a conventional dairy farmer for many years. And so one of my first questions for John is, what got you to make that switch, to take that leap? And he said, well, it was pretty easy, Anna. What got me to make that leap was lying in a hospital bed and realizing that I was there because of the chemicals that I was using on my farm. And, and that was the first farmer that I had ever met who had been conventional, who switched to organic. And what I have found in the 15 years since I first met John is that every single farmer I've met who has made that switch from conventional to organic farming has basically told me John Kinsman's story in one way or another. They've either told me the story of themselves getting sick, or they've told me the story of the pain that they felt coming home every day from their fields and having to strip off their clothes and take a shower before they could hug their children because they didn't want their children to be exposed to the chemicals. Or they've told me the stories of aunts or uncles or cousins or brothers or sisters getting cancer, and that was what inspired them to make the change. They've told me these stories, I've heard stories upon stories like these, and what we now know is the stories like John Kinsman's stories, like the stories I've heard from farmers across this country, is backed up by reams and reams of peer-reviewed science on the connection between farm chemicals and Parkinson's disease, farm chemicals and certain cancers, farm chemicals and depression. Uh, one of the most uh, important studies that we have out there that's helping us understand these linkages was started in 1993 with uh, partnerships across government agencies, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. It's called the Agric Agricultural Health Study. It's been tracking 89,000 farmers and their spouses and uh, their communities in Iowa and North Carolina since 1993. And what they have found is that uh, what I had heard anecdotally is borne out in the research that exposure to these chemicals is linked to certain cancers, brain cancer, breast cancer, colon, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, kidney, stomach, 
Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, soft tissue sarcoma, you get the idea. So when I think about this question, you know, is it elitist to stand up for organic farmers and organic farming? Uh, I think that we can say that it's not elitist to stand up for a kind of farming that protects farmers, um, farmers like John Kinsman in Wisconsin, or the many other farmers who daily uh, are exposed to these chemicals in their fields. So the other, the other group of people that I think of when I think about what this work really means is I think about farm workers that are in a way a, a subset of farmer. They are farmers as well. The first time I ever visited farm workers, again, this was on one of my mother's ideas of a good time for a family vacation. Um, she took me with her to Ohio. I was in middle school. She took me with her to Ohio as part of research she was doing uh, with the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, or FLOC, an organizing group that's still around that organizes farm workers in the Midwest. And so she took me with her, and I was you know, I was a middle school kid and growing up in San Francisco, and I had kind of thought a little bit about where my food came from, obviously with a mom like I had, but I hadn't ever, I had never seen farm workers' lives before. I'd never been to a huge, opera, a huge farming operation. So there I was, struck by what I saw, this um, families living in shacks, many, many, many people to each bedroom, and we were sitting talking with farmers, and we were talking with farm workers who were sharing with us their illnesses and their experience of what they were exposed to in, in, um, in the fields. And I remember talking with one mother through translators as her children were playing out around the small house that she lived in, and she was telling us that she had just been diagnosed with breast cancer, and that her assumption was it was because of exposure in the fields, but that she she couldn't prove it. She couldn't make that direct connection. And over the years, sadly, little has changed for farm workers. Uh, they're still among the most undervalued in this economy. Farm working is still one of the most dangerous jobs in this economy. Uh, farm workers are still, as probably many of you know, not protected under the National Labor Relations Act since 1935. Uh, when the act uh, was written, uh, farm workers have been exempted from that. Um, and, of course, they're the most exposed to agricultural chemicals. If you think about farmers' exposure, think about farm workers, many of whom English is not their first language. Maybe there are uh, 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 instructions on the packaging about how to protect yourself, but maybe they're not able to read it. Um, maybe they don't even have choice about exposure. Maybe they're in the fields when the crop duster comes along. Um, we know, again, that anecdotally we're hearing this among farm workers, but again, we have the science to tell us that there is this direct connection between agricultural workers and um, all kinds of uh, health impacts. And it's not just the workers, it's their families too, because as many of you probably know, farm workers tend to live with their families near the fields. And in one of the best long-term studies of exposure to farm worker families that's out there, a study was started uh, in the year 2000. It's called the Chamaco Study. It was started with leadership from the University of California at Berkeley. It stands for the Center for Health Assessment of Mothers and Children of Salinas, uh, which is a huge farm working community. And what these researchers have done is incredible. They met a cohort uh, of women who were pregnant and started tracking their health and their children's health since their pregnancies. So since the year 2000, right? And what they have found is startling. What they have found is that from infancy on, the children of mothers with the highest levels of exposure to pesticides and then of detection of those pesticide residues in their body were at the greatest, their children were at the greatest risk of neurodevelopmental problems. Uh, they were finding, they would track these kids. So they would track them at six months and they tracked them at age two and age five and age seven. So at six months, they found that these children had slower reflexes. At two years, they found that the kids with the most exposure to pesticides, the mothers with the most exposure to pesticides, were at higher risk for pervasive developmental disorder, a, a, a condition on the autism spectrum. At five, these children were more likely to be hyperactive, have trouble paying attention in the classroom. At seven, they scored lower on IQ tests by an average of seven points, which is equivalent to being a year and a half, or a half a year, excuse me, a half a year behind their peers. So what they were finding was what farm worker advocates have known for decades. 
which is farm workers are among the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities to these agricultural chemicals. And, you know, when I think about that personal choice that we each make, I think about the personal choice that I make around feeding my children organic food. Um, you know, on a personal level, I think about it as a choice I'm making, yes, because I want my children to have really healthy food. But I also think about it because as a mother, I don't want to think that the food that I am feeding my kids might have caused some other mother to have to expose her children to a chemical that may have stunted their lives or planted the seed of cancer in their bodies. And so when I think about this question of is it elitist, is it just self-interested to be making these choices or to be doing this advocacy work, um, I think that it is this work that we're doing to stand up for a kind of farming that protects farm workers like those in Salinas. So the, the third sort of community that I think about when I think about why I do this work and why so many people that I know do this work, is a community that I, th in sort of a, a type of community that I don't think we think so much about when we think about organic food. And that is the people and the places that are living in the shadows of the manufacturing facilities that are producing the synthetic fertilizer and the chemicals that we're using on our fields. So when the West Fertilizer plant exploded in West Texas in 2013, many people in that community didn't even realize that that plant was at risk of a kind of industrial accident on that scale. In fact, they didn't even have to, because of federal regulations, register the volume of fertilizer they were pre that they were producing, and that's part of the reason why so many firefighters lost their life in dealing with the aftermath of that accident because they weren't aware of how much was being produced there. But when that fertilizer plant exploded, 15 people died, 12 of whom were firefighters, 226 were injured. So all over the country, we have chemical manufacturing plants and synthetic fertilizer manufacturing plants that are producing these inputs for our farms. And they pose risks, sometimes really serious risks, like a risk of an industrial accident, uh, like the one we saw in West Texas. Um, but sometimes just the risk of what it means to have prolonged exposure to a manufacturing plant that is polluting your community. Dow Chemical is one of the largest uh, chemical manufacturers in the world, one of the largest pesticide manufacturers in this country, and it's headquartered in Midland, Michigan. And uh, in 2007, the EPA detected that there in Midland, Michigan, they detected the highest levels of dioxin ever discovered in any river or any lake anywhere in this entire country. And dioxin, as many of you know, it's a, it's a large class of chemicals uh, that's highly toxic. It's a highly toxic byproduct of manufacturing, especially herbicide manufacturing. And it's a persistent environmental pollutant, meaning it, it, it bioaccumulates and can stay in our bodies for years upon years upon years. And what the EPA found is that dioxin levels in some places near Dow's manufacturing plant in Midland, Michigan, were 1,000 times higher than what the EPA has said is kind of the minimum residential acceptable level. And they found that a study of women living in Midland and nearby counties had higher rates of breast cancer than, uh, than, than many places across the country and dioxin was to blame. Um, now, after years and years, I should say sort of parenthetically, I was just looking into what the latest was in, in Midland, Michigan, as I was thinking about speaking with all of you tonight. So I found out that um, I knew that there was a class action lawsuit by this community in Midland, Michigan against Dow for this exposure. And Dow has been fighting this class action lawsuit for years and years and years. And I just saw last year they have finally agreed to clean up 1,400 properties in this settlement of a class action lawsuit. Uh, and they had some spokesperson say, you know, we're so committed to uh, really ensuring that the community has healthy drinking water and, you know, has a healthy community. Meanwhile, in the process of settling this lawsuit, they have acknowledged that they have been polluting the area with dioxins 
starting in the late 1890s. So when I think about what it means to be making this, what I think is common sense, but some people think is a radical suggestion that maybe we shouldn't have our food system be totally dependent on petrochemicals and the kind of herbicides that then create a persistent organic pollutant like dioxin in our waterways in places like Midland, Michigan, uh, and called in the leaders for doing so, I would like to suggest that that calling for this way of farming, that calling for this way of farming is really about standing up for communities like those in Midland, Michigan, or those in West Texas, those communities that are living in the shadow of these manufacturing plants. So all of these, these questions, though, sort of lead us to another kind of corollary to elitism question which is, okay, so maybe you're with me so far, you're sort of saying, okay, Anna, we can understand, right? We already came in here kind of believing that uh, fighting for sustainable food means fighting for healthy communities and healthy farmers and farm workers, but what if doing so threatens the enough part of the equation? You know, then is it really, uh, sort of out of touch with us to be advocating for this way of farming if it means we're not going to have enough food. Because obviously we need to have, a, we, 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 we can't sacrifice hunger to be able to you know, have these protections. So, so what about, what about that, that piece of the equation? At one agricultural biotech conference I went to a couple of years ago, uh, there was a panel of, of so-called experts that were talking about genetically modified foods or GMOs. And one of the panelists said, that anybody who is opposed to genetically engineered foods or opposed to GMOs should be tried for crimes against humanity. And unlike this audience, nobody was chuckling, and the, chuckling. Everyone sort of was nodding in agreement. But there's this message that we're hearing, especially from the producers of genetically engineered foods that are arguing that we need this technology to feed the world. There's this messaging that's really been front and center. I'm hearing it stronger and stronger. My mom has been sort of fighting this scaremongery message for 40 years, but we're hearing it more and more that um, but, you know, we need this way of farming to have enough. And in fact, just the other day, I was listening to a debate on NPR on Intelligence Squared with the chief technology officer of Monsanto, which used to be a big chemical company, but it's now pretty wholly focused on its product line of genetically engineered seeds. So I heard the chief technology officer, Robert Fraley of Monsanto, essentially making this argument in this live stream debate about the benefits or the drawbacks of GMOs. And in his closing statement, you know, sort of final words, driving home the point about why his shot side should win the debate, he said, what I'd like to do is describe what it would be like to live in a world without GMOs. Without GMOs, Farmers would need to dramatically increase their use of herbicides and insecticides. The pressure, it'll drain more wetlands, we'll have to cut down more forests, we'll have to take tractors and run up and down the fields and release more greenhouse gas emissions. Banning GMO crops, he said, is equivalent to putting 26 million new cars on the road in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. He said, please, for the sake of all of us, please vote for GMOs, was his closing arguments. So he makes it sound kind of dire. Uh, but it raises this question, you know, are chemicals and pesticides, fertilizers, GMOs, you know, are they what we need to feed the world? Now, despite what Fraley says, and remember, he is getting paid quite a lot to say those things, um, despite what he is saying, food abundance is not dependent on the technology of genetically engineered seeds. In fact, I would go as far as to argue that this technology as we see it today and as it's been commercialized today is actually undermining our ability to feed future generations because it's locking farmers into a, de a, a dependence on bought seeds, on buying the technology fee that's required when you buy those seeds. It's requiring them to uh, lock them into that system of heavy reliance on chemicals and on fertilizers. It's undermining soil health, and it's reducing biodiversity, and all of that is undermining our ability to feed the future. 
What Robert Fraley is also not mis mentioning is the message my mother has been echoing and drumming home with everyone for 40 years, which is that people, we already have enough food on the planet today. 2,800 calories for every single man, woman, child, infant on the planet, and yet almost a billion are going hungry. And so something else is at play here than just a question of production, right? So let's not let that scaremongering get us confused about that. But the other thing that's missing from this argument is, again, this incredible new body of science that is showing us how productive these sustainable and agroecological solutions are. Um, what you can also see is you have a few other kind of test, test examples we can look to. We can look to, for instance, the European Union that's growing a whole lot of corn and soy as well, but not using the genetically engineered varieties and their yields are on par with ours, right? We can see that the, there's no big yield gap there. Um, but we also know is that the ecologists who warned that GMOs would spur a kind of scary pest and weed resistance were right. Uh, I heard the scientist Jonathan Foley, who's now the head of the California Academy of Science, says, uh, speak recently, and he put it this way. He said, you can't put out a weed resistant crop, which is what this one of the, the traits of these GMOs today, you can't put out a weed resistant crop and expect the weeds to sit still. They will evolve. They will, and we already know they have. Today, we have dozens of weeds that are resistant to Monsanto's herbicide Roundup. In fact, I was just reading some accounts by farmers who were talking about the, these, these uh, Roundup resistant weeds that were so thick, they're half an inch thick, so thick, they're actually destroying farm equipment because they're so strong. And you know, as Jonathan Foley and other scientists have said, ask any ecologist, and they all predicted this about this technology. So what we're finding is that this kind of scaremongering of the not enough is just scaremongering, there will be enough. And what we're also finding is that there's all of these other implications, um, or, uh, this uh, pest resistance and weed resistance that's, that's emerging. But the other corollary to the uh, you should be tried for crimes against humanity argument that I've heard is that um, those of us, say in the United States, that are making these claims for the benefits of organic farming um, are out of touch with small scale farmers in the developing world. In fact, there's a book out uh, called um, about the benefits of biotechnology called Starved for Science, about how the whole continent of Africa is being so impacted by advocates in the West who are anti-GMO because they really, really want this technology. Well, I can tell you, I can speak to you and, and share with you what I am he hearing from colleagues who are working on the ground across the very wide and very, um, uh, very diverse continent of Africa with lots and lots of different farming traditions, totally incredible diverse ecological regions, that they are not starved for science, uh, that they are evolving incredible technologies and innovations using agroecological principles and showing incredible yield results. And so as we think about this question of the, you know, is it elitist or is it not elitist, I think it's really important for us to remind ourselves that to be standing up for this food, it's to be really supporting farmers and farm workers and eaters, and it's to be doing so without worrying that we're jeopardizing food in the future or even food supply today. Now, I do wanna say one thing that I think um, is and really, really important to make the distinction around when we talk about this messaging that we want to do about the benefits of, of sustainable food and farming and organic food and farming. Because I will say I have heard on occasion some of my colleagues simplifying the debate and saying, well, you know, people should just be willing to pay more for their food. You know, people should maybe not buy that extra pair of shoes and just spend a little bit more on food, be willing to put some more money into, into um, their food budget. And while I would say I think that's true for a lot of Americans, 
I think it's really important for us to remember that there are 47.6 million Americans who are on food stamps for, for whom paying even 10 cents more on any food item is not an option, or all of the Americans for whom actually one third of their food budget doesn't go to food, it goes to the transportation it costs them because they don't own a car or they live in a neighborhood that doesn't have a grocery store and they have very, very, very little room in their budget to pay any, any more for food. But what I will say is for those of us who do have that ability and who do have that access, making that choice for organic or supporting sustainable food systems is part of growing the market for all of us. So when I hear uh, those of us promoting chemical-free farming called elitists, uh, what I like to do is kind of flip this frame on its head, and I like to ask ourselves, who are the real food elitists? Because to me, it seems like the real food elitists are those who are standing by and saying nothing as those tens of millions of Americans have to rely on food stamps to feed their families. Or the real food elitists are the ones who aren't speaking up about the chemically grown food that's making farmers and farm workers sick. Or the ones who aren't speaking up about how this input intensive food system is locking farmers into a state of indebtedness. And for those of us who are fighting for organic food, you know, I think that when we are called elitists, I like, to, I like to imagine, again, all of those communities that are benefited from and benefiting from sustainable food and farming as it's emerging across the country. Now, I would say that you know, if this movement, and I think it is a very diverse movement with lots and lots of parts, but if this organic food or sustainable food movement is sort of only about fetishizing that $16 jar of artisanal mayonnaise. <laughs> and I have seen a $16 jar of artisanal mayonnaise in a shop in my, near my old apartment in Brooklyn that was this like hipster artisanal mayonnaise shop. But if our movement is only about that, then yes, I think we could rightly be accused of maybe a little bit of being out of touch uh, with most Americans. Or yes, if our movement is only about, say, organizing for longer shopping hours at our local Whole Foods, then yes, I would say we'd be kind of a, a rightfully accused of having an organizing for the 1%. But that's not what I am seeing. What I am seeing all around the country, and in my work I get to travel all around the country and see what's happening on the ground, what I am seeing all across this country is an incredibly diverse, incredibly thoughtful, incredibly savvy food movement that's really working to change the system in ways that benefits all of us. I'm seeing college students across the country that are transforming their food service to make sure it benefits local farmers and benefits students on campus by bringing in healthy food. I'm seeing communities like yours that's doing really incredible work to bring healthy food into school nutrition programs and universal free breakfast programs. I'm seeing work like the work of my friends and colleagues at the new AmeriCorps program called Food Corps that's working to bring educators into uh, school gardens in underserved communities. So I'm seeing this kind of movement happening all across the country. I'm seeing uh, work to promote policies and actions across the board that support farmers transitioning to organic. I'm even seeing our US Department of Agriculture launch initiatives like Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food that connects people across the country to their farmers, and starting things like an organic food literacy program for USDA staffers that has now trained 30,000 USDA staff in this organic literacy program, spearheaded by Kathleen Merrigan when she was at the USDA. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing communities bringing organic food into, uh, into supermarkets, into farmers markets. I'm seeing food hubs being created, making that more accessible to institutions. I'm seeing environmental groups and food groups taking on those agrochemical companies and drawing these connections. And so in all of this that I am seeing, I feel like I see on a daily basis, and this is what gives me so much hope, um, I'm seeing on a daily basis the ethical roots of the movement for organic food. Thank you.
So we have a few minutes for questions. We have a couple of microphones, uh, if you would come to the front. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you described a big engine of business as usual that's arrayed for the industrial complex. And a lot of the allies in that complex, where is the forces other than ethics? Or where, just what are the market forces? Where, where are the interests that lie with a return? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that has been so encouraging to me is that as I think this very diverse food movement has become ever more vocal, I mean, I trace the food movement. I don't think it's a new phenomenon. I mean, what I'm saying, the joke with my mom, is exactly what she said 40 years ago, and she stood on the shoulders of many people before her. But I do feel like there is a growing, uh, growing movement, and out of that growing movement, I feel like there are companies that are listening and understanding seeing the writing on the wall and understanding that this way of food and farming is the future and they're benefiting from it from their bottom line. We're seeing the growth of companies like uh, the farming cooperative Organic Valley, which was started by dairy farmers at the height of uh, the economic crash for dairy farmers uh, many years ago. It was started as a farming cooperative. Its mission statement, its core mission has been to support family scale and family farmers. And uh, I have had the, the privilege of speaking at their annual meeting and meeting their farmer members. And to me, Organic Valley is one of the greatest examples of how to bring this ethic, bring a real ethical approach to business to um, a multi, I mean, I should remember the stat of how much their sales are now, but it's huge, huge, huge sales, right? So we're seeing that. We're seeing things like, um, you know, another great example, I think, is a company like Costco that not only has taken a much higher road for its employees and it and staff than, say, a big box store like Walmart. Costco uh, has a highly unionized workforce, and then the, the workers that aren't unionized at Costco get to benefit from the same benefits of their union workforce. But we're seeing not only that those food sector workers at Costco are benefiting, but at Within Costco, you're seeing an increasing number of organic food items, antibiotic-free meat. So you're seeing this movement, and I think it's really up to us as as um, advocates and activists to be part of that interplay to make sure that uh, to call out companies um, that aren't whose supply chain is not really in line with their eth ethics, and then to support and applaud those companies that are doing the right thing and show them that there's a business case to be made for this because there certainly there certainly is. Yeah. Hi. Um, it seems like your mom's big message was if we all stop eating meat, there's enough food for everybody. And even um, organic meat and dairy are, is not sustainable and full of natural hormones and carcinogens. So why don't you mention that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I actually talk a lot about meat and the meat and dairy industry in my work. And, and absolutely, I mean, my mother's message, Diet for a Small Planet, 40 years ago, um, it, her, her message really was understanding that, um, that the, this industrialized meat and dairy system where you're taking, now it's almost 50% of all grain is now going to um, even more so than when she wrote Diet for Small Planet. That that industrialized system exists because poor people can't make market demand on that grain and, and companies are finding it more profitable to turn it into meat and dairy, uh, industrialized meat and dairy. And so, um, so absolutely, I think that, that talking about the impact, especially the climate impact of the livestock industry is key. But I also think that there are ways, and Organic Valley is, I think, a good example of this. There are ways within that system to be definitely decreasing your carbon footprint. And since I don't think that we are going to get everybody to cut out meat and dairy from their diets, um, I think that what we are seeing is that there is um, real proof that you can get people to move on that spectrum toward consuming less meat and dairy and then when you're making those choices, to be making them from, uh, from growers who are using best practices and cutting antibiotics off, out and cutting drugs out of, their, um, out of their production system. So, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, uh, involved with a food project in Ashland, Oregon that's really taking off and is beginning to spread throughout Oregon and other cities in, in the country. 
And, he, and the basis of it is that we provide food on a continuing basis based on neighborhood cooperation and donors to the Ashland uh, Emergency Food Project. And the way it works is quite interesting. The, way, the reason why it's catching on is that every week when you go grocery shopping, you buy one extra item. You come home and you put it in a bag we give you. And then after two months, we notify you with an email that we, to put it out on your, by your front door and we'll come by and pick it up. And the upshot is, is that uh, in one pickup, uh, we generate 24,000 pounds of food in a, in a, in a community of uh, 20,000 people. So a quarter of the households in Ashland are involved in this and it's growing. And I'm, what we're doing now is we're trying to, trying to uh, make people aware of coming up with foods that are going to be sustainable, you know, that are going to be healthy. And this is our challenge, is how do we pull this off mm -hmm. and get people to really think differently. And what's the name of the project? It's called the Ashland Food Project. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's on the uh, uh, internet. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah, so one of the, the other trends that I think have been so encouraging is I have met a lot of folks who work in the food bank world, and they and and um, they sort of self identify self identify as renegade food bank workers. And what they've been part of is part of this real rethinking about the um, the food bank model, and that historically a lot of food banks would sort of have their metrics of success be based on weight. How much food did we give away? How much did it weigh? And you know, the bigger that number, the better, right? If if you the, the more you gave away, the better benefit to your community. And these renegade food bankers uh, are part of this movement of saying what we really want to care about is what was the quality of that food we gave away? Were we just a turnstile for Pepsi and Kellogg's to get their boxed products on our shelves and then get our food bank members to become, uh, associate that brand with a good thing and then when they have some money in their pocket to buy that brand at the supermarket, right? And so they've developed a new metric system for evaluating food banks based on quality, not quantity. They're doing things like starting farms on, uh, on the food food bank property and growing their own food. They're doing things like partnering with local growers and gleaning food from farmers who maybe have products that aren't, that are too small or too big or too bumpy or too whatever for their retail business, but either buying them at much cheaper prices or even getting them donated and using that fresh food to bring that quality to their members. So I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening in the food recovery world and in that food bank world to really do this thinking about what would it mean to really be promoting health uh, in our communities. Um, I'm going to take over here, and then we'll come here. Yeah. And, and then um, I'll take them both. Yeah. OK, so first I want to say thank you for coming um, here. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and I also really appreciate the fact that you acknowledged um, the privilege that comes with shopping organic. With that being said, um, I guess I just kind of wanted to ask you, like identifying as a woman of color, like. I understand that not everybody has those options. So, um, yeah, that. Uh. Yeah. Well, I think what you, that's a, I, I really appreciate that question, and then we'll get yours in one second. Um, but I think what you're getting at is kind of what I, what I was talking about at the end, which is to say, to make this distinction between the advocacy work that takes your finger out and says, you should eat this way or buy this food, and you should, you should, you should which I think is kind of getting to your point that that's like this elitist perspective, assuming that you, that person could do that, has the access to do that, that you even have the right to tell somebody what they should be doing, versus the kind of advocacy work and the work that I'm seeing on the ground in the food movement, which isn't the you should kind, but it's saying what we are trying to do is build a food system that isn't a sort of two Americas of food. That isn't, you know, a food system for the wealthy who can afford it and the food system for the rest of us, but is saying that you shouldn't have to live in a certain skin, uh, a zip code or have a certain skin color to be able to make these choices. You should be able to make them wherever you live, whoever you are. And it's, it's on all of us no matter where you live and who you are, to be making a food system that, that works that way for everybody. So that's, that's kind of what I mean. But thank you for raising that. Yeah. I'm a kind of an advocator myself. Uh, I work for the Isla Vista Food Co-op, community-owned natural food store. 
and um, which in Isla Vista, right next door, is generally known as a very food insecure area. And, um, and it's a very interesting area because you have a lot of college students on a really wide scale between having wealth and not having wealth and bilingual families. And I kind of noticed myself um, dealing with that ideal of el elitism a lot. And um, I just wanted to know your thoughts about like the responsibility of retailers mm -hmm. and other advocators. Um, our store just put in a system, um, our, our new uh, called How Good. Are you familiar with How Good? Mm -mm. It's a really. Yeah, let me let me jump in and I'll I'll yeah get to your question about the retailers, the piece around retailing, um, and then I will read one thing and then we will go because I do have to catch a plane. But I think that your this question of kind of the role of retailers I think is a really important one, and part of the conversation about how we're going to fix this food system and make it work for all of us, uh, it's critical to include food retail workers and food workers as part of that. When you look at who are the most food insecure people in this country, it is workers in the food system. They are the most underpaid, the most exploited, the most overworked, uh, and in the case of farm workers, the most underrepresented by federal law. And so, um, so working to do things like have citywide and um, citywide increases in uh, minimum wage, you know, living wage laws, doing that kind of thing, working with fast food workers, standing shoulder to shoulder with Walmart workers and other workers that are really trying to increase that, uh, the minimum wage, uh, doing, I, I do a lot of work with the Restaurant Opportunity Center that's working with restaurants to try to improve working conditions for restaurant workers and actually eliminate the tipped minimum wage, which is bonus points for anybody who knows. You probably have some food workers in here. What's the minimum wage for tipped workers? $2.19. $2.19 is the minimum wage for restaurant workers and tip workers. So, um, so I think you know that, to me, is, again, part of this, how are we going to make this work? We have to make sure that food workers are getting that representation and getting the kinds of wages that then enables them to be part of putting their own food on their table, being able to make their own choices about what food they have. Um, so I want to close with, um, with this quote, since this book is up here. I didn't talk so much about food and climate, but this was my last book. But I want to close with these words from uh, my uh, friend and a writer, an environmental philosopher named Susan Griffin, who some of you may know, but she's a lovely, lovely writer. And it's how I open Diet for a Hot Planet. And then I will rush off to the airport. Like artistic and literary movements, social movements are driven by imagination. Every important social movement reconfigures the world in the imagination. What was obscure comes forward, lies are revealed, memory shaken, new delineations drawn over the old maps. It is from this new way of seeing the present that hope emerges for the future. Let us begin to imagine the world we would like to inhabit, the long lives we will share, and the many futures in our hands. Thank you. Thank you.